Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's discussion, Responding to Racism in Schools. My name is Louise Albertain, and I'm Senior Advisor to the Bertha Center for Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the UCT Graduate School of Business. Along with my colleague, Simnikua Klanga, we will be facilitating today's discussion. We asked all of you to submit your questions when RSVPing, and we received no less than 60 questions, so thank you for that. We therefore abandoned the idea of a more general discussion in favor of responding very particularly to the themes that have emerged from your questions. Today is an equipping session. It is my great honor to introduce our three speakers today. First up, we have Lavlin Nwadei, who I'm sure many of you in the education community are familiar with. So Lavlin is the founder and director of Elning Consulting, and her purpose is to see social justice normalized in various sectors, including business, academia, and religious spaces. And with her master's in peace and conflict resolution, both her studies and what she spends her days doing now is characterized by facilitating interventions and hosting critical conversations with stakeholders in education. Next up, we're delighted to welcome Dylan Ray, who is executive director and co-founder of Shakaya, a nonprofit organization supporting teachers and school leaders to think critically and engage as compassionate, active, and democratic citizens. Dylan co-authored A School Where I Belong and works closely with Facing History and Ourselves, managing the South African program. He's also co-founder of Future Proof Schools. Next up, our third speaker for this afternoon is Kechilwe Nseke. With a master's in clinical psychology, she's an associate for the Inspirational Development Group, which must be one of the best names for a consultancy I've heard in a while, a UK-based company with a South African footprint in organizational and leadership development. She's consulted for UCT in various capacities, including training, facilitation, individual coaching, and psychotherapy. And as you'll hear her also speak of today, I'm sure she is very interested in understanding and utilizing mindfulness-based interventions. She has experience and interest in co-developing cultural diversity programs within the university setting, as well as the NGO sector. We are going to start with um, some of the questions that you've shared with us. The majority of teachers that I've met, having been a teacher before as well, are the, those people are characterized by deep investment in the children that they work with. But something is broken. And many of us who are here today are coming to understand and to be equipped and seek to change that. So we have a series of questions that are illuminating some of the common themes that came from those that you submitted to us. Between myself and Simniki, where we will be asking the panel a series of questions, um, and we will keep an eye on the time so that we can get to as many of the questions that you've submitted as possible. As we invite the guest speakers to share with us, if you also just want to take um, a minute to give any framing thoughts that you would like to, or you can get right stuck in with the question. The first question, having needed conversations, characterized by really listening, and then making changes that dismantle the oppressive systems in our school. How do we do that? Kehilwe, you, unfortunately, I'm gonna pick on you to go first. Thanks for the introduction, Louise. <laughs> and hello to everyone. Goodness, I'm the first person on. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, to be honest. So, I mean, I do believe that this is a big, a, a bigger conversation. It's, it's, we are at a particular time in our history where we're really needing to, to go deep and really look at where we are at and uh, why we're here and one, some of the things that many people feel that they've been doing and have been doing and somehow nothing has changed. And I think that um, the, the core agenda of our institutions needs to shift from what it's been and kind of addressing anti-racism uh, or race-related issues as something you would put in the category of, you know, when we do recycling and climate change, etc., which are very important uh, things for schools to be embarking on. 
but I really do think that if we are, if we are, if we care about this, we are going to start and say we actually are. It's clear we don't know what we're doing. It, it's clear a lot of us have done, but not gone the full gamut. And what we really want to see are people starting to measure. If you care about something, you want to be able to say, I'm measuring it, I'm monitoring it, I'm course correcting at different stages when I see that things are not working. So we cannot have uh, half the school involved and some of the school not knowing. And so my whole thing is that we need trust right now. We need consistent, decisive leadership. We, we need to um, not fear what, where we're going. We need to arrive with open hearts and be curious with a desire to want to, to do more. And I really think that the strategy needs to be, let's start from the beginning and say, what, what, how are we hearing about the experiences of our learners and past learners in this manner, in this way on social media? Why did we not know? So we need to do a thorough investigation around that and, and do this right. That's my feeling. Lavin, do you wanna jump in? Um, yeah, I can, I can take a stab at it. Um, there's a few things that's going through, that have been going through my mind actually in the last while. Um, because I, none of this is new. So that's just one thing I wanna put on the table. Um, and those of you that know me know that I'm quite a straight shooter, so I don't want to mince my words because I feel like the stakes are too high for us to, to beat around the bush. I, I, I don't think this is new. I think that, um, that a lot of us know what's been happening and we can relate to the stories that have come out on social media because we've lived those stories. Um, and I think that over the last few years, there have been efforts by a lot of schools, um, you know, to explore, as Gilwa said, that to explore these different issues and these different conversations. Um, and so I think that there are two places where I would like to focus on accountability today. I think the one place where I want to focus on accountability is this industry of, I don't know, diversity specialists and transformation specialists. I don't know what people like to call people in that space, but let, let's just use that term for now. I think there's a, there's a need for this industry to be held to account. And it's not even an industry because we're not like formally, formally constituted. But I do think that there's, there's um, a space for, for practitioners in this space to be held to account. Um, because I think that a lot of people have been doing work in this space, facilitating um, these dialogues, having these conversations. And I think that the evidence, at least in my view, suggests that either what we've been doing is too surface level um, or what we've been doing has been misdiagnosing the problem, right? So I sit in a lot of conversations where people want to talk to me about diversity and inclusion and I get very irritated. Not because I don't think that diversity and inclusion are important, but I think that even in the language that we use to talk about these things, we're dishonest and we misrepresent what it is we need to talk about. We don't need to talk about diversity. South Africa has always been a diverse country, even before 1652. We've always had different people, right? What we really need to talk about is this question of transformation. And even though transformation has lost its credibility because of the way it's been politically um, sort of manipulated, I do think that there's value in exploring if we really go to the root of what transformation means, what, what, would, be, what would we be looking at? We'd be looking at shifting the cultural and the institutional architecture of the environments that we're in. And in this context, we're talking about education. So transformation needs to have something to say about how you shift the DNA, right? Or how you revisit or reconfigure the DNA of an environment so that children don't feel like they need to perform an alternative identity where they're negating themselves and who they are in order to exist there. So in this case, we're talking mostly black children and children of color who feel like they need to perform a different identity and negate themselves in order to exist in the X Model C in private schools. Or when, so that for me is an example, or when we talk about inclusion, like inclusion is great, 
But again, we, we forget that inclusion has a power dynamic. Someone has to do the including into something. So we include, just as they did for all of us post-94, you're welcome to my school. Come through these pearly white gates, like welcome. We've included you, but you must be grateful to be here. Right, so there's a power dynamic in the work of inclusion. But if we talk about belonging and we talk about what is that shift that needs to happen laterally to say, how do we make an environment one where everybody can feel at home, then we can start to have more honest conversations. And for me, the best definition I've heard of inclusion, oh, sorry, of belonging, is how much of myself do I need to leave behind at home in order to exist here? If we want to answer the question about belonging, how much of myself do I need to leave behind at home in order to exist here? And that's a question that when we ask it, the answers we're going to get will help us work backwards to figure out how we fix these environments, right? So this accent I'm speaking in, I don't speak in this accent to my parents. My parents don't hear me speak like this, but I speak in this accent because I learned from as young as six years old that in order to survive in South Africa as a black person, I need to sound as close to white as possible, right? So that's one of the things that I've learned. So what I'm saying is there's a room for us to have an honest conversation about what this diversity specialist industry has done to present really flimsy material. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but I mean to present material that really doesn't go to the root of addressing power, of addressing traditions and legacies that are built in exploitation, which is why we have school systems that then allow certain children to have a particular experience and other children to not. That's the conversation I'm interested in. And I'm sorry, but I don't believe that that conversation is a conversation about sharing stories because I think we've been sharing stories. We have a wealth of stories about what we experience in different environments. For me, it's not about stories. It's about doing the deep intellectual work required to undo our wiring our wiring around supremacy, our wiring around systems of oppression and domination, our wiring around what is human and who is human and who deserves to be afforded certain rights and privileges in our society. That's where the work is. So that, that would be my initial thoughts and I'll stop there because I'm getting very excited. But yeah, we'll continue. <laughs> excited is, is what we have to be. Um, uh, Oh, sorry, Louise, you didn't say I should speak, but I presume. Sorry. Dylan, just go rogue. Just, just be normal. <laughs> just presuming I have a voice. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, I think there are a couple of things. One, just to, to, to pick on what Levin said, I think that's, you, you know, uh, we did some work with a, a boys school in um, KZN a while ago. And, and the, the focus of the work of the day was around deeply understanding race and the history of race. Because we, we feel that, we, that until you actually understand how, how race has been constructed as a historical, you know, it, how it's been constructed historically as a, as a creation, um, we can then start to dismantle that. Because you can see, oh, hold on, this could be broken down. And it was for heads of departments. So they were, had to science teach, any, every head of the department had to go. Of course, you can imagine the, the science or the, the sports head of education, his enthusiasm for being in that room was pretty low. Um, and it was, it was one of, I think, the, one of the most uh, profound experiences we've had, myself and Roy, who I do this work with, because by the end of the day, all 25 of those heads of department were all deeply engaged on an intellectual level, having understood stuff that they'd never really engaged with, but also on a personal level, because they've seen how almost this, this, these constructions in their head and it really, it was that one moment where it gave us deep insight to, to confirm what Loveland's saying is that, is that I, I would say that people still need a space to share their stories in a lot of, in a lot of schools, which is why people are taking to social media at the moment. Um, and sometimes those do need to be heard. But, but for sure, that deep work of, of we've got to re-hardwire both the schools, but also our brains has to happen. Um, and, and I think, you know, what, 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 what I see as lacking uh, in in, our, in the work that 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 schools accept, because I think uh, I think there is an issue about what do we offer schools, 
But I think there's also an issue of what do schools really want to do? Because a lot of schools really just want the quickest, easiest thing that I can tick off my box. And we've, when we've been doing this work since 2003, but, but post uh, 2016, you know, we, if we had a graph, we could measure the amount of enthusiasm that, that schools had for this kind of work was just off the radar. And slowly it's decreased, and decreased, and decreased until a few weeks ago. And then it shot up again. Um, and that's because the hard work hasn't happened. And so some of that, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that hard work that people don't want to do, it's two things. First of all, it's, it's being in uncomfortable conversations and spaces. There's, there is a reluctance to have discomfort. And, and that discomfort always emerges when we talk about race. The conversation moves very swiftly from, it tries to move, we don't let it, but it tries to move from race to gender and uh, sexuality and xenophobia and any other ism, but don't talk about race because that stuff is just too uncomfortable. So, so th there's this reluctance to have discomfort. And I, I think, and Roy, my colleague, we've, we, our feeling is unless there's dis discomfort, then we're not doing anything. People have to walk out of the room going, that was however uncomfortable. I felt angry. I felt hurt. I felt good. I had all these emotions because if you all work out feeling, oh, yay, happy, that was nice, then we haven't done the work. Um, mm -hmm. Which means it's very hard to get day two and day three. Because when people are feeling discomfort, they don't want to go, well, why do I want to do that again? Um, and so, so it takes a brave leader and a brave school management to say, we, we're going we're gonna to push through this in the long run. Um, and, and especially we're going to push through when people are starting to feel discomfort because that's our measure. If we get people feeling discomfortable, discomfortable I made up that word. If we get people feeling uncomfortable, we're there. So, so I think there's this reluctance to have this thing because we keep on talking about a safe space. We need a safe space. Of course, we need a safe space. But safe space is like a hug, you know. You also need to be brave. You also need to be pushed off the edge sometime and see if you can swim once you hit the ground hit the ground, hit the water. Um, so we need to also be looking at like, how do we reframe, I don't want to say our work, but the school's work to around like being brave and, and, and stuff. But then there's one last piece and then I'll keep quiet, is around for us, the, 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 the work and, the, and the, 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 the plea with schools and the sell to schools and the nudging, it, it's not about the first few workshops and these things, it's about what will eventually happen in the classroom? So, so what are the teaching strategies? What is the, what is the curriculum resources we can put in front of teachers that, that can, they can start to do because it's from the classroom up that we create the system. It's not created from a principal. Um, uh, the principal can put all the rules they want in place and you need good leaders, but it's the classroom that does the space. And um, we, we, our work has always been based on what happens in the classroom. Sometimes you need to have all the staff in a room in order to get to the classroom space. But, but the reality is for a lot of school leaders, the classroom space is the last place they're looking for because there's the sense of, I mm. can't intervene in what that, that, that's the sacred space between a teacher and their kids. But as long as we leave it as a sacred space, then we have all of that stuff that's been on Instagram emerging because we've left it as a, a space that we can't touch. Actually, we've got to touch those classrooms. We've got to say mm -hmm. that's our, our, our starting point. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause there because we have a lot to get through. Mm. Yeah, thanks um, to all three of you. But I think to, to drill down there that, that we need to talk about teachers, right? We've been talking about schools, we've been talking about environments, but, but children have been hurt and they've been hurt at the hands of teachers. So one of the themes that also came out from the close to 500 people that are joining us on this now, is a question of how do schools deal with teachers on their staff in terms of their hurtful and damaging behavior? I think that's, that's one group. And also how do we bring reluctant staff along with us on this journey? It's a question I posed to the three of you. Lovelyn, maybe you want to kick us off this time. Uh, that's not an easy question. <laughs> um, Okay, so I think I'll, 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 yeah, I'm going to try to answer that. So I think the first part is, um, I think it's really important to just recognize that, and just from my conversations with a lot of teachers at the moment, I think teachers in South Africa in general 
um, are generally dealing with quite a lot. <laughs> um, and I, as I'm listening to people express how they're feeling, there's a wide range of feelings, right? So some teachers are just like, oh my word, it's about time. Can we just get, get on with it? And other teachers are completely hurt and feeling so vulnerable and so defensive and just completely shattered by what's currently happened. So I think really as simple as it sounds, it's important to recognize that um, people are on a journey and people are on different parts of that journey, right? Some people are really far ahead. They've got their woke dictionary like right here. They're ready at all times. Other people are just entering the conversation and others are outside the school campus, you know? And so for me, I think it's important that as we think about the types of interventions that we're going to offer um, to our staff members, that we are very intentional about understanding where people are at. And that's important for two reasons. The one is that people need to feel heard, whether we agree or not with what has happened, whether we um, think they should be fired or not, whether we encourage or discourage what's happened, people need to feel heard because if people don't feel heard, um, it's very difficult for you to, um, to engage with them. The second part is that we've actually got to realize that we don't need everybody in order for a system to work. And I know that sounds controversial, but you don't need 100% of your staff to be anti-racist in order for your, your school to be anti-racist. Sometimes you actually just need a core group of people who are really in strategic positions, who have a level of um, authority within the school and are able to actually champion the cause, right? So when you look at some of the work that sociologists have done around social movements and social movements that have had a long lasting impact on their society, they only needed to engage about 30% of the population, right? So, I mean, obviously schools is a smaller number, but what I'm saying is the principle is you don't need everybody, you just need enough people on the train. Um, and then some of the others might come along eventually. We also need to acknowledge that there are people who just don't want to change. There are people who just do not want to change or are never going to change and that's okay. But we can't channel the limited resources that we have and the limited time that we have to now focus so much on the five people who don't want to change when we've got maybe 10 people who really are ready and we've got 20 in the middle who are still trying to figure things out and then there's the five at the end that are, for lack of a better term, are problem cases. So I really think it's important that we are, we are intentional and strategic about how we respond to the different needs on our staff. But also at another level, I do think it's important that whilst we're responding to teachers, that we take into account the broader ecosystem that makes it possible for teachers to behave in certain ways or say certain things or teach particular things, right? So we've got to also look at the ways in which an institution needs to hold itself accountable, right? And that we can get to maybe later on when we talk about things like, you know, what do your policies and procedures look like? Because racism and sexism is coded, it's encoded language that's embedded in those types of institutional mm -hmm. accountability mm -hmm. mechanisms. We've got to ask questions about representation, right? So if you don't have uh, different voices in the room, if you don't have different voices on the SMT, if you don't have different voices, um, you know, that are constantly in interaction with the children, then you can do whatever you want with the teachers. But at the end of the day, the broader environment is reinforcing a particular message for the children as well. Um, and then I would say probably lastly is that um, I, and, and, and again, we'll maybe get to it later on, but I don't, I, I don't take the approach that, um, I think we've got to recognize that there are, there are things that make it, ex okay, to be blunt, racism is in the air that we breathe in South Africa, okay? Racism, like South Africa is a racist country. It is a, it is a sexist country. And so I think we need to think very carefully about how we approach conversations about punishment and accountability when it comes to the ways in which we want to hold teachers and staff members accountable for their behavior. Because I think that when we haven't given people um, the, the tools, the knowledge, the information, and also the spaces in which to process things like racial literacy, engaging in critical race theory, engaging in intersectionality and feminism, and you get shocked by what comes out of people's mouths, there is a part of me that feels like we shouldn't be dishonest and pretend like 
these are not fish who are swimming in a particular type of water. So that for me is also, and, and I mean, I'll need time to unpack that later, but all I'm saying is that I think we've got to be very careful about the approach that if a teacher says something racist, they must be kicked out of the school or they must be suspended. Because I do think that we've got to be honest about the fact that racism, it's embedded in our society. Racism is not just about good or bad. There are beautiful, fantastic teachers out there who have good intentions, who are racist because they've grown up in a racist society, not because they are bad people. And until we do that racial literacy work as a society, where we understand that racism is not just about good and bad, but it really is about socialization, then we're really going to keep punishing people in ways that aren't productive. So I suspend you from school number A, three months later, you're back at school B, and you're going to exhibit the same behavior because we haven't taken you on the process, on the journey to undo that inner, inner work that needs to be done so that you don't repeat the same behavior. So yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Mm. Thanks, Lavin. Kehilwe? Well, I will just add um, from where Lovnan's left off to say that she's so right. You, 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 you have people across the spectrum and some who have done a lot. And there are so many people who are asking, what can I do? What can I do? And often it's the people who are also the first people to be very defended and very um, uh, and really have that resistance that comes up because this is challenging a key you know, aspect of their identity, a core part of their woundedness that really requires them to do the individual work. But we can't lead people to, you know, we can't bring the river to the horse, so to speak. But what I do think we can start doing is exactly what she's talking about, which is the racial literacy. People need to actually take responsibility and we as parents as well need to put pressure on schools to make sure that teachers are in, you can call it a book club if you like. It's not, it's not too much to ask for teachers to, to, to equip themselves. The, Google is available. This information is flooding, flooding the internet. And it's, 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 it's not okay that when it comes to certain issues, teachers will know so many things about anything you think about, conservation, you name it, but are not able to address this. And we recognize because by, you know, by the very sort of historical intergenerational baggage we bring, it's a difficult, difficult conversation to have, but it has to be done. It has to be done. And, and I honestly believe, and this might also be controversial that White teachers need to have their spaces where they do the work by themselves. People of color must have their spaces to do the work by themselves. You need to read, have the safe space to tell your group in which ways you, you exhibited racist behavior, what happened when you were called up, what happened to you, you know, speak around your fear, go back into the world, do some more work, go back and just keep going. And I feel that it's not, at, there's a point where we need to say it's, it's, it's actually, it's not okay to be asking, what should I do? There is so much out there and the, the people who are reluctant to come along, you know, they, they really must just be swamped by the, the, the majority of the people who I do believe morally want to do the right thing. Um, and that's part of the reason why they're teachers. So yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's mm. my feeling there. Mm. Dylan? <clears throat> sure. Um, so I'll I'll just pick on different things that that were, that were said. I think uh, you know what's been interesting about the. Uh, I, I guess we uh, we have a stereotype. I have a stereotype about older teachers, and I would class myself in that older teacher category as well, having grown up during apartheid. Um, and in our work, I think if we had predicted. Um, uh, where the resistance would come from. Um, I think what, what we've found in the, in the many workshops and thousands of teachers now, I, I think we found that, yes, there was some aspect of older teachers resisting because of that stuff that's deep inside. But I think that's balanced by the equal amount of older teachers who've, who've, who've said, okay, I, I, have some, I have some work to do if I'm still going to stick around here. And, and we don't have the facts and figures of this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna limit this just to, to, uh, 
private schools because this is where we saw it the most in what was happening, but I'm pretty sure it, it may play out at other places. But there was a worrying, growing number of young white teachers who were the most conservative, most reluctant um, to, to engage in this space. And I think that for us has always been a, a question of what's, what's happening there. And part of it, I think, is explained because, quite frankly, the schools that these kids come from uh, haven't done the work anyway. So, so they're not coming from schools that have shifted and transformed. And the universities themselves are not necessarily doing anything with these students in those four years that shifts things either. Um, but, but I think there's, there's a danger of us thinking that these people will die one day and then we'll all be, you know, all be fine um, or they'll retire. There's the, 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 that's a, it's, a, it's a warning sign and it, it's not backed up with, um, and Nick Spall would not be happy that it's not backed up with any, any um, facts. Um, I, I'd, I'd love to just say something about the, 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 the what we do with the racist teachers. So there's that example of this of the slave auction and the teacher was offered sensitivity training, which sounds like we're in Stalin Russia, um, but also was then and well then resigned and exactly as Levin said, we'll end up at another school and you know which which is welcoming and things. Um, and so so I think something has to be done. I think there has to be some accountability for these actions because. Because while, while, yes, we maybe can't punish everyone all the time, we have to ad admit that the vast majority of these actions go unchecked, go unspoken uh, about, but they have an impact on children in the class. And, and so we, we also have to measure the, the response to these acts in the, in the discipline in some way that, that equal the effect on, on the young people or the adults who are getting this. Um, and I, unfortunately, though, you can't drop someone into a, I don't know, a racism, anti-racism week and, you know, they'll suddenly immerse out of it. But, but I think that's where the leadership has to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to keep this person on our staff, but, but if this, if this continues and if we haven't done, if we haven't sat down with that person, if we haven't put that person in conversation, we haven't forced them to read certain things in a year's time, we're accountable if they continue. Um, and I, I, I think that's one of the issues is that the, the leadership don't hold themselves accountable for the kinds of people who are in their staff and, the, and who's, who's, been, um, uh, who's been appointed um, and who's allowed to be there. Um, and, and I just want to say, I, I'm, I'm, I, while, I, while I do think there's, there's space, we need to have our separate conversations. Um, I, I, uh, part of me says that that haven't we been all having our separate conversations for way too long? Um, and I'm just speaking for, for uh, yeah, I don't know, this could be dangerous, but I'm going to go with it, for, for peop white South Africans who look like me. Uh, most white South Africans don't talk to anyone of color, any black South African. We'll just talk to white South Africans and, and we'll have things confirmed or they'll talk to South Africans who feel the same thing. And, and I think there's a, while there's a safety is that maybe I can say certain things, the danger that comes with that too is that we then, we can also have things confirmed and we can leave those environments going, huh, actually, you know, my, my view is confirmed of, of the world. So, so any, any, any separate interventions have to always have the goal and space of saying, and, and now let's talk about what we've learned. And now let's learn something together. Um, so, yeah, um, I'll pause there. Evelyn, Kehilwe. <laughs> Sorry, Kehilwe, have you spoken um, in response to this question? Or can, can I jump in? Is that all right? Okay, thanks. Um, so just a few things. Um, so I think it's important to understand what, what is it we're asking for when we say people should do their work apart before they come back together? So I agree with you that generally white people are talking to themselves about their own things. But generally when white people are together, they're not having critical conversations about race. So the types of conversations that I believe myself and Kilo are talking about in terms of having separate spaces or affinity groups as they're referred to, is really about spaces where white people can start with the work, right? Can actually just start with the work. Because when we have normal, like everyday conversations and we're all talking about race, um, I'm here in that conversation. I've been dealing with race since I was three years old as a black child. 
white people in South Africa and in most parts of the world are not socialized to see themselves as raced beings, as racialized beings. They're not socialized to see themselves as other. So white people might know that they're white, but they don't know that being white means certain things or means anything in a particular structure of their society. And so by the time I come to a conversation with you, Louise, the chances are you've never been exposed to critical material on white fragility. You've never been exposed to critical material on white privilege. You've never been exposed to critical material on institutional racism. You've never been exposed to critical material on the invisibleness of white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. So by the time we arrive in a conversation, we're not on the same page. So I'll say, Louise, you're privileged. And Louise is gonna hear me saying, you're saying I don't work hard. But I'm not saying you don't work hard, I'm saying you're privileged. But because you've never had to critically engage around that with other white people, it's a foreign concept and all you hear when you hear privilege is this attack of, I don't work hard, I don't work hard. And the consequence of that, and I'm really hoping Kehilwe will get to this, the consequence of that is that when we have these conversations together and we haven't done our own work separately, me as the black person is doing an incredible amount of emotional, unnecessary emotional labor just to get you to believe me that racism exists, just to get you to believe me that that thing you said is offensive, just to get you to believe me that privilege exists, which is an inordinate amount of work to do when you could just go sit with other white people and a if, um, and a facilitator who knows what they're talking about, who can help you through the conversation, through the material, so that you understand what we're saying. Then when we come together, we're on the same page, right? And then we can say, okay, cool, we figured out, we get it. I know that there's some things I'm missing, but now we want to redesign the code of conduct at our school. So how do we redesign this code of conduct in such a way that it's not being inadvertently racist or inadvertently discriminatory? And because you've done your own homework, Louise, as somebody who's done the homework to see, yeah, when we say certain things in a certain way, it is coded racism. Then we can arrive in the conversation and I'm not trying to convince you about it. So when we're talking about affinity groups, we're not saying separate people just so they can have frivolous conversations apart. It's separate people so that there's, they can do the meaningful work that needs to be done without the psychic violence and the unfair emotional labor that's transferred onto black people and people of color in those conversations. And then there's work that us as black people and colored people and Indian people need to do together and apart, right? I was just talking about this earlier, about the fact that now we're all talking people of color, people of color, people of color. No, babes, I'm black. Like, I'm so black. <laughs> and we've got to understand that our history, what our history did, was to oppress everybody that was not white, but in different ways, right? So everybody who's not white was treated worse than white people, fact. But the ways in which Indian people were treated, the funding that went to Indian children's education, the neighborhoods where Indian children could live, the property that Indian people were allowed to own at particular points in history is not the same narrative of what was done to black people or to colored people. And the same in terms of what was done to colored people versus black people, right? So there's a family discussion that POC need to have apart and also within the family discussion have to have separately, right? Because our experiences are different. So we're all oppressed and damaged by white supremacy, but in different ways. And it's difficult to have that conversation in front of each other when we are not on the same page, right? So even for white people to acknowledge that colonialism and apartheid has damaged them, that there is damage that's been done to the psyche by white supremacy. White, white supremacy isn't good for white people. Yes, it's allowed them particular benefits and privileges over time, but there's still damage that's been done. I, as a black person, can't help you through that. I might be able to help you to a point, but there's still work that needs to be done in that community. So that when we all come together to try and be the human race and to try and do this beautiful work together, we're actually talking from a place of having done our own emotional work. It's the same when you're in a relationship. You can't have a productive relationship with somebody who hasn't done their own emotional work, who wants to bring all their emotional baggage to you. 
you've got to, we've each got to do our work so that we can actually figure out how to build something together and that's the point of it and in south africa we haven't done that i've sat in conversations with white people where i'm the only white person a black person and i'm there at the family bry they're frivolous conversations what are white people talking to each other about they're not talking critically about race and yet for a lot of us in, in black communities, colored communities, Indian communities, we're constantly having to work through this stuff, constantly having to ask each other, hey, did that, did he, did he just say that? Am I, am I crazy? Yo, but my bo boss also did this. We're constantly working through it because it's the only way we get to survive, right? And that's the difference. How do we understand the stakes? For a lot of us, the stakes are so high, right? And only when white people start to realize how high the stakes are for them to have this conversation and have it meaningfully, only then will we actually be able to move forward in this conversation. Sure. Um, thanks, Lovelyn, Kehilwe, and Dylan. You've touched on a number of very important points. And um, one of the questions that came out was the role of parents. And if um, you can take this question on what is the role of parents and how do we support them and the children, given the mental health, a burden on institution racism. And I'd ask Kehilwe to kickstart um, this question, especially uh, being it a mental health focus. So the psychological um, effects of, of, of racism, of of white silence, of, of carrying the burden that comes with being in spaces where one person is underrepresented. And let's just put it into like staff rooms, for example. Staff rooms are fraught with, it's, it's, it's very, very scary places to be. Um, the, 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 I think the stress response that we are dealing with here, I mean, I think when, when, when the two of you, Dylan and Lovelyn, speak about the mental work, I honestly, because of the framework I'm coming to, think that race lives in our bodies. You can even do a whole lot around understanding what it is you need to be saying, doing, etc. work on yourself but you are going to find that because of what we carry in our bodies, that is not just from this lifetime, that is from the intergenerational stuff that we're carrying, we are walking around with massive wounds and the defensiveness, the resistance, the amount of tension you see comes from the fact that individually and collectively, we, we haven't really started doing. So I would say that you know, having worked in a higher education institution, taking care of young people in this dispensation, it is amazing to see that both white and black children are traumatized. It serves nobody to allow a three, four year old to continue to see and categorize people as that's what brains that are that young do, recognize their skin color realize that when they roll up to any traffic light in this country, the people who are going to be outside the window begging selling are a particular color, and you as the parent will not engage that, con you know, that question. It, it starts young because what we are doing is we, we're seeing our children mirroring our trauma. So our children are actually here to raise us. If we allow our children to almost illuminate for us our blind spots, the things that have wounded us, is that from the moment a child speaks to you about anything, when you've put the, the television on and you can see protests and you start engaging it like you would anything else, you start saying yes about that observation and you start putting it in context, you start telling your child who they are, you are doing a lot of, the dis, I mean, all that it does really is, it does what Lovelyn is speaking about. It has a group of children who arrive in these spaces totally unaware about who they are, what it means to be in this space in relation to others. And it has another group of children who race related matters are dinner table conversation on the regular. From when they can speak, they actually know what's happening. And so all the time there is this having to compensate, which is stressful and having to work with people who are, and I saw one of the questions around, what do you do with colleagues? 
Well, that's the thing. It is actually now about us thinking about, it cannot be an individual thing. I would, I would say that one of the things that we've seen that this pandemic has done in terms of COVID-19 is it's, it really has shown you that you can't just think about I, me by myself. Everything that's happening here is happening over there. How other people are doing over there is, is here in our bubbles, our cozy places. And I would say that in schools where people are having to navigate this journey together, even the most reluctant person needs to come on the journey because actually we are all in this together. And that reluctant person, if they want to come on the journey, it could just be around that book, the book club. Start to read one book, come back every week to that book club and say nothing if you don't have to, but you cannot hide around the, the I, do, I'm, I don't know what to do. And, and it's not about how, what to do to help. No, let us all recognize that this problem is all our problem. Racism is all of ours. What you are about to do in the next moment is for you. It's not to help those people or to help the cause, it's for you first so that you can start actually coming into your work, into your relationships, into society, into your parenting, knowing um, that you're working on it. And I mean, I would even say that people should actually just start having little, you know, I, 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 I go to the point where I, I write little things for people to say, you know, if you're, if you're feeling uncomfortable about calling out others who are perhaps going against your anti-racism work, you might have something that you also need to put in the back of your pocket that you pull out and you, and you read because you are activated. Your body is going to tell you to run, to keep quiet, to shut down. But we can't afford that right now. Thank you, Kehilu. Dylan, um, Lovelin, any responses to this? Yeah, can I jump in? I, I, you know, I think this, the issue of parents is such a crucial, crucial thing. And I think that the, the, it's both, again, the problem and the solution with parents. So the problem part is that parents choose the school for what the school currently is and has been, generally not for what the school will be because their kids will have left by them. So even, even parents who are currently in a school, no, no, not many parents want to shift it too much. I'm happy that it gets shifted, but not if it's going to improve impact in any way on my child's education for now, for the present. So there's, there's that dynamic. I mean, the people who stick around are the teachers and, the, and obviously the, the principals. Um, but so, so in one thing, it is about what is the message that we tell about our school to prospective parents? What is the message that, that you know, if parents knew that I'm coming to the school and what this means coming to the school is that parents are required to do some hard work around issues of race and all these things. If that was, that was the, 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 the communication that has gone out, then parents are not going to choose the school or not choose the school, but they, they know what they're going to get. So there's, there's pre-work that has to be done. But, but I, I, um, I, I, just, I think there's something about that, that idea of, um, that Kihilwa said about the book club. You know, I think, it's, I think schools have a huge influence over, can have a huge influence over parents if they really want to. You can imagine if, if, um, if, if COVID stuck around for the next few years and we made sure that there was online learning for everybody in schools, there would have to be a time where the school said, and now we're going to have to train, t train parents to be a bit of teachers and to be IT efficient and to use all these different programs because otherwise the school won't be successful. There'd be a, there would be workshops for parents on how to do all this online learning stuff. There would be resources that go every week and blah, blah, blah. So, so, and, and parents would buy in because, you know, this is what has to happen. So what we need to do is also to say that this is what we demand of parents. We demand parents that, that over the next few weeks, everyone's reading the same book. And then we're going to have these workshops where everyone comes together and, and shares insight on this book, which is going to raise some of the issues we want to, we want to do. Um, and that we, 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 make it, we make it as compulsory as it can be. And, and as you know, schools can make things many, very often compulsory for parents to attend budget meetings and all these different things. Um, but but through, the, through like an intervention, like a, a book club that, that uh, a book drive that everyone has to participate in, 
but also in the in the weekly communication that that principals will do with parents if if the content of those newsletters is not just about our sporting successes and our cultural days and blah 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 blah, blah was also about and this is what we've got to work on this is what we're challenging with this is how we can all participate this ongoing series of discussions is happening which guess what it has this topic of race because that's what we're going to deal with if schools put that all in place and it was just part of the dna of the school we would eventually start to shift parents and of course if we don't shift parents if we think that we in a school exist in this bubble and well we can't we can't we have to ignore them because we can't control them and we can have no impact on them then we can do miracles in the school and then everything's undone when they come home and then we have to do miracles again in the school so so schools actually have to see not that this engagement with parents is that it would be a nice to have it's it's an essential to have as much as it is essential to engage with the teachers it's essential to engage with the alumni and of course it's essential to engage with the um uh the the, the learners themselves and let's not even bring in the engagement with the education department because that's a whole nother time thanks dylan lovely yeah thanks so much so just very briefly um i think that there's uh firstly I think that it's important for us to realize that a lot of our parents um, are also not uh, racially literate people. <laughs> so I, I mean, I've done quite a few workshops with, with parents at schools who've been able to actually convince the parents to come. And I honestly don't doubt, especially for the kinds of schools that we have on this call, I mean, just thinking about where some of these schools are, are situated and located. I don't doubt that parents are interested in having these conversations. I think that parents feel lost um, because a lot of parents just have never had to engage meaningfully in conversations about race. And so I think it is important that um, the school does think creatively about how they position these subjects um, and these issues when they're wanting to invite parents into the conversation. One of, the, one of those things is about actually just um, suggesting interesting reading material. So there's a fantastic organization called Ethnic Kids um, who have books for children from, I think they're from grade R, oh, um, lies, sorry, grade one, like grade R kids don't, <laughs> from grade one upwards, um, grade one to seven. And Ethnic Kids, for example, has um, books of children of all colors, all races, all religions, and they break down all these difficult concepts in ways that children can understand, right? So it starts at a level of just literature. What are parents reading to their children? So before you even tell parents come in for a workshop, literally a hundred rand extra line item, five books. You can literally just get a few children's books that you put together as a package and you offer to your parents as books that your little ones need to read or you need to lead, read with your little ones, right? And that for me is just a really easy, quick win, first step, right? I mean, there's always extra line items that schools put in for other things that I'm not going to judge you. But anyway, I think those are, that's a way that we can approach that. The second thing is to recognize that I don't think we can do meaningful transformation work at our schools without centering the voices of parents of color. And I'm being intentional by saying centering the voices of parents of color, because for a long time at most of our ex-model C and private schools, their children weren't allowed there right? Those schools were not designed for children who aren't white. And so it means that there are so many blind spots that the institution will have and will only be able to have access to by asking parents of color for their opinions, their experiences, and their understanding of what the space is. So many of our parents, and I speak from experience because I went to an ex-model C school, my parents were so grateful that I got in, that they weren't even willing to shake anything. Like if my teacher said something, I did, I did something bad, they would believe them, even if I hadn't. My parents were so grateful that I got into these schools, that they weren't willing to shake up anything. So we've got to understand that any meaningful transformation work needs to shift the power dynamics and bring the voices of the parents of color to the center of the conversation, because those are the people that are going to give you insights into what's really happening in the minds of the, of the children at your schools. That's a really important component. And then lastly, tell parents that actually there is no point to an education that does not prepare you for being a critical 
um, citizen in society, right? So we're able to convince parents to pay for extra subjects. We're able to convince parents that your children must do extra piano because it does this and does that for the brain. Your children must do extra sport, extra this, extra that. Why are we not talking about race, gender, sexuality, and the critical literacy around these issues as a core academic skill that is necessary for you to be a productive and useful human in our society. These are things that if you understand them, you become a critical thinker. And then five, 10 years from now, we've got an active citizenry who don't just sit back when the politics of the country is going to BS, right? Because we've developed a group of children who are able to think critically. So we mustn't underestimate that education is the space in which minds are shaped. And if the education that we're offering children is an education that doesn't require them to think critically about identity and think critically about power, what do we think is going to happen 30 years from now? Of course, we're going to have a passive citizenry. We're already going down that trajectory. So I'm saying that as schools, we can be creative in how we encourage parents to enter into conversations that might seem difficult and seem uncomfortable, but recognize that these are skills that are core to living in the 21st century world, to living in a fourth industrial revolution. Your accounting degree is not going to matter anymore. Right, it's actually going to be, cre and sorry, I don't mean that like about accountants. I'm just saying that there are certain skills that are going to be taken over by machines. Critical thinking can't be taken over by, mach by machines. Empathy is not going to be taken over by machines. Compassion is not going to be taken over by machines. An understanding of intergenerational trauma and history is not going to be taken over by machines. So we need to get our children and our parents on board by presenting this as a critical education imperative, not just as a nice to have because black people feel sad about being in white schools. It's not about that. Thank you, Lovelyn. Um, I must say there's been quite a richness in the questions that were raised and they all seem to connect to one another. And one of the things that came up was the alumni and the legacy of hurt. And so how do schools respond to the hurt experienced by alumni? Um, perhaps Dylan can start this one for us even though it may have been years that <laughs> you've been at school, but maybe for you to kickstart us with this one, um, the hurt, this legacy of hurt that's being experienced. First of all, Simi Kweer, what do you mean by years since I've been in school? What are you trying to imply? <laughs> um, well, look, I, 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 don't, I don't speak, obviously, for someone who has been hurt in that way. Um, so, so perhaps I, I, I don't, and I don't want to speak about how we address the hurt, but I, but I'll say one thing about what I think schools should do, and and maybe the how would be better, um, and the and the the the, the emotional engagement could be better. Um, uh, you know, not that I'm not, I'm not probably the best place for that, but but I would say first of all, that the alumni in many of these schools has been, and I say the black alumni has been ignored um, and the in a lot of these schools that that have financial alumni obligations the the important piece has always i mean the important focus has been who's got the checkbook who's you know putting money into keeping this going and so so schools have traditionally had a very um uh kind of a um yeah a, a relationship with the alumni that is about what 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 can we get from you you know um, there's, there's very, there's very seldom been a relationship that where the alumni is saying, this is how you should do things better. So schools aren't used to that. Um, but I think what's, what's, what's happened over the last while, and, and we've said this a lot to principals in engagement and some have listened and some haven't is that, is that you, you have to bring in the alumni of those who, who maybe 20 years since they've been out of your school, because they don't forget that pain. They don't forget the hurt. And you can transform your school as much as you like. And it can be fantastic. It can be the great Rainbow Nation school we want. But you're always going to have people behind you saying it's false. It's just done for the wrong reasons. It's, you know, because, because I don't know what it's now. I just know what it was like then. So, so uh, alumni have to be brought in and have to at least begin. And this is where I say I'm, 
you know, this is, would be my view, it, at least begin to say two things. What, what was your experience? Like, like the, the school, whoever's there needs to hear it. We, it needs to be acknowledged. It needs to be, needs to be said that I've heard you and hopefully said that, that I apologize or the school apologizes for that and is sorry. But also, like, what are you as the alumni, what, what is it going to take for you to care about the school? What is it going to take for you to, to, to come along with us to help to shift things? Can, can the alumni be brought into some of that work around the policies? Can the alumni be brought into some audit of the school to say what part of the school does not, is not working? Um, so to also, to also bring the alumni in to say, let's, let's shape this. Let's, let's make this a place that you would send your kids to. But I think until there's been an acknowledgement and that people have been heard, I think it's going to be, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's going to be really hard. Mm. Just quickly going to interject there before um, I give my colleagues an opportunity to close out because I'm aware that, um, thank you. Our participants don't seem to have left us yet, but I know that the guest speakers need to. So I'm going to ask you to perhaps um, in responding to this also just to um, end off and then I have um, something that I will uh, share at the end in closing. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think just closing thoughts. So I think that this is a really um, important moment for us as a country. I think we mustn't underestimate the hope and the potential that emerges from this moment. So I've been facilitating a lot of conversations in the past week between schools and their, and their alumni associations. And one of the things that I remind both the teachers and the school management that happen to be present in that conversation is that um, these alum and current students who are expressing their hurt are demonstrating it's an act of love and I think it's really important for us to bear that in mind that when someone tells you that you've hurt them it means that they respect and love you enough to tell you and so I think that whilst this moment is raw and it's painful and it's awkward and it's embarrassing I think we've got to acknowledge the fact that what a lot of these um, especially alumni of color are saying is that we really do still love our schools and we want to see our schools succeed and we want to see our schools do better, but we're just hurt. Um, and so I think it's important to then reframe the conversation as an expression of love so that we can start to reimagine possibilities, right? When you know someone does something for you out of love, you receive it very differently than when you um, imagine that they're doing it out of malice or, or ill yeah, ill-conceived intent. Um, and then the last thing is, I think in any conversation that's going to happen, please ask people, what does justice look like for you? And I think that we're doing a huge disservice by, you know, thinking about, uh, yes, we must apologize. So please apologize, just offer an unreserved apology. This is not a, I'm sorry, but apologize, number one. Number two, ask people, what does justice look like for you? Because whilst in the media, the justice conversation is fire the teacher, suspend the teacher, do that, do that. In a lot of the conversations that I've been having, justice is please just train the teachers so they can pronounce my name correctly. Please just train the teachers so that they understand that there's a difference between Hindu Muslims and uh, Hindu Indians and Muslim Indians. Please just train the teachers so that they, they can understand that my hair cannot follow the school rules because my hair doesn't grow out in the same way that Sally's hair grows out. So for a lot of our alumni, justice is not actually about punishment. For a lot of the alums, justice is just about recognizing what you've done wrong and committing to doing better. So I think we've got to bring this conversation, this back into the conversation. What does justice look like for you? Ask the people who have been on the receiving end of the hurt what justice looks like for them. And then also ask the people who have been accused, the people who are the supposed perpetrators. I don't like using the victim perpetrator thing. I think it's a false binary, but the people who've been accused, ask them, what is justice going to look like for you? What does good look like for you? And both of those answers helps to bring us to a better picture of what this outcome can be, because it doesn't have to be punitive. It only should be punitive where really there's no demonstration of remorse. There's no commitment to change. There's no intention to shift. That's when I think we can be punitive. But if we offer an opportunity for restorative justice, I think we can really create a more exciting and more 
healthy and more um, loving uh, school landscape in our country. So those are my closing thoughts. Thank you. And I would like to also add on to that and say, and please, can you teach your teachers that black racial identity in young people actually pushes them to being in groups. You can't have elite schools punishing children because three or four of them congregating become dangerous and become, you know, you ha we have to mix. Well, no, th there's research, there's study. You need to know if you are going to allow people in then we need to know who these people are and recognize that young people are finding one another at that age. You want people who, you know, eat your food, do their hair the same as you, listen to the same music, all of that. So it's so normal. And, and what I would really like to just circle back to is the idea of what we are allowed to do and not do in these schools. Many, many of the staff are, are asking, please do this, please, this. there's a lot of gatekeeping. People cherry pick what they want. Most of the time, what you're asking them to do is to do a full, full audit, a full strategy, so that the lens, you know, the lens is 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 titrated across from your admissions to your, to you know, to 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 your recruitment to, to to how you're disciplining people. But often schools want to cherry pick because the leaders have decided which part they want to work with. So I would really, really say that let's not gatekeep. If you really want work to be done in schools, you need to be open and have had time to introspect. And the other thing that I would like to just do quickly is just to go back to what would we really like to see with schools? And I'm going to use um, Nene Mulifi, who is a, a big sort of specialist in the area of trying to do culture changes in organizations and schools being one, one, you know, that is that leaders, we have to start with leaders. Leaders, you cannot be a leader who is not modeling, you know, modeling what you are asking everybody to do. You need to be a leader who is opening the, you know, calling out things, seeing your blind spots, being able to say, no, that part of the community needs this, that does. You have to be seen and model to be a leader who wants to change. Okay, and then the second part is, it's all the people who uh, Loveland's speaking about. It's the parents of color. It is also the, 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 the teachers of color who are often like 5% in the school. Or even if they're 50%, the structure of, 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 of racism really just squashes their voices. You need that. And thirdly, you need to actually in, engage other people to hold you accountable. So I would like to see a place where principals come together and really account for one another. What have you done? What did you do last year? How are you cost correcting if that didn't happen? We have to figure this out together. It cannot be that one school in the southern suburbs of Cape Town is doing better work than the next school. And it doesn't matter. Private, public, we are all supposed to be raising the next generation. So it's all our our issue. That's it. Thank you. Just to, just to, I'll be very quick. I, I want to just reiterate what, what Levin said. I think, I think that point, that question, Levin, around what does justice look like to you, I think is so, is, is a question that, ha that hasn't been asked. Um, yeah, it's always been presumed what justice looks like. And I think I, I would just add to that if I can, if I can jump on your question and, and, and the question I'd be asking of, of, uh, of, alumni of learners of parents is is what are, what does better look like like so that let's let's create well, let's create better together because we've only been creating better and success by ourselves like you know what does it look like to you um and 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 i just you know my my parting thoughts and this love and echoes what you were saying earlier on um even though it, it may have sounded like i was disagreeing with separating people um because i think we agree on that people need to come together at some point but but the reality is that the people who have most of the work to do, it's, it's white South Africans like me. That, that, and unless that deep, hard, uncomfortable discomfort happens, uh, the system doesn't shift unless the system gets broken down. Um, and this has to happen now because we're running out of time before the system does break. Mm. Mm.
Thank you, Dylan. I think that definitely echoes something I've also um, heard Lavalin share of. This is, this is not something of tinkering at the edges, right? And just doing enough. This is something that's fundamentally unjust and needs to be, um, and we need to acknowledge that and address that. I recognize that, thank you for staying with us, attendees. I see that you're all still with us. I think, um, I haven't been able to keep an eye on the chat, but I just spotted that comment towards the end that said this could carry on for days. I think days is, uh, yeah, is an understatement. I think this is a, this could be a year long journey. And I think that's something that some of my colleagues here have shared that that's what they're also asking of schools for. This is not a standalone workshop. This is not a day. This is a journey. And, and thank you for so generously giving of your time. Gehilwe uh, Dylan Lavlin this evening to help on that journey. May we all be um, fortified in continuing with what our particular journey looks like and doing the hard work for that. Um, in another act of generosity, our guest speakers have agreed that I can share their email addresses with you. So please feel free to, to reach out to them. Um, we have recorded the session. We will make it available. As soon as it's ready, we will send it out to all the attendees of this webinar. So thank you for your time. Thank you again, Kehilwe, Dylan, Lavlin. Thank you, Simni. All the best colleagues. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. <laughs>